if we already have a live stream available. If we have already live stream available, can, can I kindly ask the technical assistants to share the link, the YouTube link, so that we can have it for our colleagues? Then I propose to start with a couple of, in a couple of minutes, when we will have everyone here. See several participants here, but not everyone online. And I know that some of them are joining our own site, but I'm not sure if everyone, how many people are on site. So I would uh, suggest we wait a couple of minutes for everyone to join. See some people on site. I, I see Marit and Thomas. Can you tell me if there is anyone else, any other speaker on site? Not that we can see. Thomas on site. Uh, I have seen already that uh, there is uh, Mariana uh, Sarmiento uh, who, and, uh, and Lina Duque, sorry, uh, Lina Duque del Vecchio that is already online. Perfect. Let me just quickly check. I don't see K uh, KS Park connected yet, nor Angela Daly, nor Sabelle. So I, I suggest we wait a couple of minutes uh, until they join so that we have a proper start. So if we can maybe wait just only two extra minutes in time to join. I see Angela now is connected. Excellent. Let's see if uh, I, I know that I'm hearing that Sabello as is having some problems to connect. Uh, but uh, he, as he is the last speaker, I hope we will be able to manage this soon. Let me just send an email to KS to be sure he can connect. All right, as we already have uh, five minutes of uh, delay, I think almost everyone 
uh, is here. I see Sabello also. Okay, I'm, I'm hearing a bizarre echo. I hope we can now check the sound. Yes, perfect. Now, so we, I, I, I am not hearing my voice twice anymore. Excellent. Uh, I see everyone is here. We are only missing uh, KS Park, but I'm sure he will be able to join in the next couple of minutes. So uh, good morning to everyone. And let me welcome all the participants, speakers, everyone, both uh, online and on site. Uh, we still have uh, this very peculiar hybrid uh, for a format, which is uh, actually really hybrid for the first time, because I'm seeing that there is quite a number, a good number of participants on site, and we have also a good number of participants online. Uh, my name is Luca Belli, I'm professor here at FGV Law School in Rio de Janeiro, where I direct the Center for Technology and Society at FGV. And I have also the, the pleasure and honor to be the coordinator of this uh, dynamic coalition on natural neutrality that was actually funded uh, precisely 10 years ago by a group of uh, supporters of internet openness. And uh, we have some of them with us also today. Uh, I would like to really uh, welcome uh, with uh, great pleasure and, and, and great friendship the very stellar panelists we have today. We will start with Commissioner Lina Maria Duque del Vecchio, uh, who is Commissioner at the Colombian Communications Regulator, CRC. Uh, then we will, unfortunately, we will not uh, be able to have uh, Ms. Carlotta Inez Fontana from the European Commission because she had another uh, uh, commitment that she, she could not cancel, but we are very happy to have uh, Miss Mari Paloleta uh, from the, with the Senior uh, Regulatory Director of, Affair, of Regulatory Affairs at Etno. We have also our good friend Thomas Loninger, who is Director at Epicenter Works. We will be joined hopefully in a few minutes by uh, Kim Sin Park, KS Park, who is Professor at the University uh, of Korea and Director of OpenNet Korea. Uh, we have just been joined by Professor Angela Daly, who is Professor at the University of Dundee and also a visiting professor here at FGV Law School. And last, but of course not least, we have Sabello Malambi, who is a founder of BALA, a, uh, an African startup, but also a researcher at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard. So we have a very uh, interesting panel composition. Today we will speak about a lot of many of different uh, issues, all uh, related, of course, to internet openness. And as you might have uh, understood from the very title of this session, dedicated to the internet openness formula, interoperability, device neutrality, and net neutrality, we have really strived to organize a session that may be as uh, as multifaceted as possible. So as you, as many of the people that have been following our work for the, over the past decade know, this dynamic coalition of the IGF is a multi-stakeholder group that has been uh, discussing net neutrality and internet openness for 10 years, literally. And uh, we have been promoting net neutrality as a fundamental principle to preserve internet openness uh, but we also acknowledge that internet openness is not synonym of net neutrality. They are, uh, net neutrality is a fundamental component of internet openness, but the internet openness formula indeed is much more complex and it requires also thinking about interoperability, thinking about device neutrality, and uh, we will explore these three different dimensions today with our panelists to understand how the role that internet openness plays in promoting not only human rights and the full enjoyment of fundamental rights of internet users, but also competition, equality of opportunity and permissionless innovation, the safeguarding the very same generative and peer-to-peer -peer nature of the internet, which is what has made the internet so rich and so useful over the past decades. Uh, we will start by exploring uh, net neutrality issues in different geographical areas, 
uh, although we acknowledge, as I was mentioning, that intern that internal openness is much more complex than only focusing on net neutrality. Net neutrality uh, debates have been uh, occupying uh, policy circles in various uh, geographical areas. We have seen that there has been very recent attention and strong, I would say, also attention in Brussels and in the, at the European level about the, uh, the proposal to introduce a, a fair share model based on the center party networks pay uh, model that was has been uh, strongly debated uh, over the past years. And we will hear more about this uh, from Marit and from uh, Thomas. We have also seen that this very same discussion played out in South Korea over the past couple of years. And we will hear about uh, this from, the, from KS. And also we have seen that there has been very recent developments, in, both in terms of st studies uh, conducted by the regulator and also jurisprudence uh, at, the, uh, at the Colombian level. So also Latin America is a region where net neutrality and internet open, openness keep on being uppermost in the agenda of policy ma makers and various stakeholders. Uh, without further ado, I would also only like to mention that uh, my colleague uh, at the FGV uh, Law School, oh, she just she just joined, Smriti Parshira. So we also, I will co-moderate with uh, this session with uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Smriti Parshira, that was in another session that started with a little bit of delay, but fortunately she have just, she, she managed to, to join. Now, before we start with the, with the keynote remarks of uh, Commissioner uh, Maria, uh, Lina Maria Duque del Vecchio, I would only like to ask uh, to the uh, technical assistants to please uh, uh, mute by default uh, all partic online participants and do not allow them to share things unless the technical assistants uh, uh, permit it, because we have had last year a several example of uh, Zoom bombing that I would really like not to uh, see again in uh, this session uh, in, at the IGF uh, in general because it is very easy to prevent this with default Zoom options uh, not allowing speakers to, well, participants to speak or share unless they are allowed. If you want, you can, uh, you can make me co-host so that I can do it myself, but please just let's try to adopt this very basic cybersecurity measure so that the, the entire session will will evolve in the uh, smoothly and in the best uh, and most convivial uh, way possible. Uh, so without uh, further ado, yeah, first of all, I would like to, of course, uh, welcome my colleague Smriti that has just joined, and then I will give the floor to Commissioner Lina Maria Luque del Vecchio for her keynote remarks on the situation on, of net neutrality and internal openness in Colombia. Please, Lina Maria, the, the floor is yours. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much, uh, Luca, for your introduction and for allowing us to participate here. It's a pleasure being here. Good morning, everyone. As you already said, my name is Lina Maria Luca. I work with the Regulatory Communications Commission of Colombia. I am the commissioner there. And it's a great pleasure, as I already said, to be here and to share with you the results of this study that we just held about net neutrality in Colombia. This study, we already, we finished it just last year, 2021, and I hope you are seeing my, my, my presentation. I'm sorry that I have to share it in this size because I don't have the, the chance to make a wide presentation, okay. So um, this is study um, that we, that we the developed uh, has us on a starting point. In 2011, Colombia established uh, the frame, the legal frame uh, work to define the rules about net neutrality in Colombia and, and how we identify this definition in our legal system. This legal frame, uh, frame established that it couldn't be any kind of blocking, interference, discrimination, or restriction of the right of the users to access to content and applications on the internet. Obviously, as long as those applications and content are legal. It also defines that providers cannot be doing any kind of arbitrary um, 
uh, actions discriminating content or applications based exclusively on the origin or ownership of those applications. Uh, in this, based on these provisions, the CRC has the, the goal to establish the regulatory conditions related to uh, network neutrality, and we build it uh, based on the um, um, few principles that are really, really important. Free of choice, non-discrimination, transparency, and a duty of information. In 2020, because of the network pressures generated during the isolation due to the pandemic, it was established that the network communications providers and internet access providers may implement some kind of traffic management measures, but always that have to, to be applying principles of no discrimination. Um, this is like the framework, the legal framework that we have and the regulatory framework that we have. In the study, we also, we also uh, made an approach of the international situation regarding regulatory definitions and decisions about this net neutrality. Uh, this is how we identified a, a wide range of positions. That we, as, as Luca already said, we have different kind of, of approximations of, of this situation and legislation has a wide range of, of really, really extreme situations. We have cases like Australia, Japan, and New Zealand in where the obligations are only confined to the duty of transparency by the service providers regarding the traffic management practices and how they apply it to the networks, but they don't have any specific legislation of, uh, or regulation in this regard. On the other hand, we, all, uh, we have cases like the European Union, where we find the prohibition of zero rating offers and the guidance that they are addressed to the national authorities to be monitoring and ensuring compliance with rules to safeware and equal non-discriminatory treatment in internet traffic services. And we also find this case of South Korea that was already mentioned that is really interesting in which we have to be focused and be following if it's, in, if it's going to be or not a charge or an obligation to remunerate remuneration of the networks by the content generators. Uh, we already, with, with these things in mind and what was happening around the world, uh, we analyzed Colombian situation and how we were working and how we were dealing with this internet net neutrality situation. As I already mentioned, our regulation has, has been established in our principles of free of, free of, uh, free of choice, non-discriminatory discrimination, transparency, and information. And the law establishes that the internet service provider can offer plans according to the market and the user needs, according also with their consumption profiles. So under this context, the CRC, um, and taking into account the situation of the market, the study could uh, identify that we have um, uh, almost 39 postpaid offers, 22 packages that, that we use of applications. So the most common applications like Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Snapchat, and so on. And we always, we, and the other kind of, of access to the service does this, the prepaid plans. We have uh, 136 plans identified with 76 packages included applications in an additional capacity or unlimited use for the for the users and the consumers it is especially important for for us to highlight that this diversity of offers uh, between different operations can make you let us understood how the market was working and how the the, the different operations give offers to the market depending on the opportunity, the pertinence, and the user's decisions. So the users are making some kind of pressures, making the operators to have more and bigger offers. Especially uh, regarding to zero rating practices, uh, in Colombia we, all, we have those kind of practices, and we can say that they have become a quite common type among the different operators in Colombia since the users are requesting them. 
uh, this in the next slide, I would like to, 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 to tell you that this study also has a, an open consultation. We couldn't only uh, see how the market was behaving around papers, but we needed to consult a different kind of, of stakeholders, such as users, applications providers, internet service providers, academia, and among other parties. They had the chance to participate and express their comments on the regulation that is already established in Colombia and how they feel around this, and if they can really use and be part of the decisions of being having access to internet. From the results that we obtained from these consultations, we could observe that the regulation that is focused on principles that I already mentioned it has been sufficient to address technological and market changes. And the development has been occurring around the, mar the telecommunication market. That's why we didn't find any kind of need to have any regulation change, but obviously we have to keep this in a permanent, we have to monitor it, the, the situation of this market all the time. Um, in the next slide, I can, I, I can show you how month to month it's been changing the use of different, of different applications between the users. Uh, this, this is important because we could identify that the, the market has the ability to, to change. And we find multiple offers of plans uh, as a response of the use of the needs of the users and the market movements. Uh, we have all the time inclusion and exclusion of applications with the data packages offers that depends on the needs of who? The users. They are the ones that are telling all the time to the operators what they want to use and why they want to use it. This graph is, um, is showing how month to month this variation works in the last two years. And uh, even we can find that, that we have applications that have been maintained over the time. There are others that have been changing, going in and going out, depending on the popularity that they have between the users, one among the users. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we show you as well how the evolution of the consumption of internet officers and application in Colombia has been working. And the net neutrality study that I'm talking about, we also quote an additional analysis that we made about the OTT consumption of uh, habits in Colombia that includes the behavior of people uh, uh, that has that has smartphones between 2019 and 2021. What we found, we found there that the users of um, that the the users uh, use mobile services but applications and has a, a little change from 74 percent to 78 percent. The consumption of OTT audiovisual services went from set. 32% to 36%. And the application messaging services went to from 77 to 78%. So this is a variation because of the use that the consumers have been making of the, this applications. Uh, and with this evidence in mind, um, the preferences of the applications, we could find that the offers that we have in our market are changing because of the user's needs. So the CRC has this kind of, uh, and we have this study that you can, you can uh, have a, a look of it. Uh, I think we don't, I don't think we have it in English, but we can do something about it. And we also have an, another situation that we, well, that we ask for it because it's not only that we have the law and that we have the regulation. We also went to the enforcement and control entities in Colombia to find out if they have any kind of investigations about this matter. And uh, they told us, officially told us, that they don't do really have the, any kind of investigations about this matter. So this give, you, give us an additional evidence about the, how is the legal framework and the regulatory framework working. And that's why we didn't find any kind of um, evidence to change the regulatory framework in this moment in Colombia. 
we finally, uh, as I already said, this is a study that, that we made um, allows to identify that in the, the rules that we have in Colombia that, uh, that allows zero rating offers has given more alternatives to users of different kind of income levels. Uh, in any case, this is a topic that has been is in this in a permanent discussion from the perspective of innovation and market trends. And we are always seeking to promote access to the internet and content uh, by the Colombian uh, market consumers. We also wanted to tell you that actually in this moment, currently we have a legal debate in our constitutional court about the the zero rating offers in our country. We don't have any kind of conclusions right now uh, about this, this, this the trial that we are having here. But we really think that it's important that policymakers um, have in mind that, it's, that it's, it's, it's crucial to maintain a balance between extreme decisions. Uh, protecting the users, of course, they have to have the right of freedom of choice, but not necessarily going to prohibitions the situation maybe could make to be losing, losing any kind of benefits from these users. We believe that the ideal point is one in the middle where when free market has the possibility of defining how the offers can be given to the users and can be suitable for different market segments and how, and, and this has to um, make uh, some kind of development of the market always focusing on the users and this freedom of choice of the users. This is our um, this is our study and I hope you can read it. And if you have further questions, obviously we can we can be there for you and ask everything that you need. Thank you so much for for your time and for the opportunity. Sorry. Thank you so much, Commissioner Lina, for giving us that uh, overview of the experience in Colombia. And it's really interesting to see how, uh, you know, the study is so evidence based and based on so much data and information. Uh, we also note that you said that the, you know, the zero rating topic still remains open, uh, unlike in a lot of other jurisdictions where countries have uh, taken, a, you know, a stronger stance or a more lenient stance on it already. Uh, so with that, let me invite uh, Thomas Loninger, who is the director of Epicenter Works, uh, to come in and give his comments on uh, both anything that has been said so far by Commissioner Lina, uh, as well as perspectives from Europe or anything else he'd like to add. So over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it's a great honor to, to speak here again at the IGF. Um, where to start? Um, the title of this event and the issue that concerns us is the fragmentation of the internet. And I think we currently see two trends that lead to this fragmentation. Um, the one is um, very close to home for me, the debate about sending party pays and new network fees that um, the telecom industry in Europe wants to establish. Um, and that's, as Luca has mentioned, uh, for those in the debate long enough, uh, this all sounds very familiar because we exactly discussed this idea 10 years ago at ITU level and they were rejected. Um, now there's discussion um, that we need this money for network investment, um, which I think is a flawed argument because uh, we don't lack money in Europe for investing in networks. It's basically a power grab uh, from the telecom industry because uh, what this proposal would mean in practice is that um, most companies that rely on cloud hosting would see the prices rise. That will, of course, also affect public broadcasters, private media, SMEs. Everybody who relies on the cloud to provide an online service will be affected by this. Um, everyday consumers will see their subscription prices for Netflix and other subscriptions to rise because everything that is um, data intensive will become more expensive. And it's important to pause here and uh, just come up with the reality of how the internet looks like today. Yeah, the uh, traffic is increasing exponentially, and it has done so for decades. That was never a problem. The equipment gets more and more efficient, so we'll see that with the same cost of network equipment, you can actually transmit more and more data, particularly in the area of fiber networks. Um, and the most 
bandwidth intensive services are video streaming applications, but they make up only 2% of the revenue that's generated with the internet. The majority of the revenue comes from search engines and e-commerce, and they only make up a minor fraction of the bandwidth that we transmit. It doesn't take much for a Google search field to appear in your browser, um, but yet uh, this idea which brands itself as being fair tries to redistribute uh, money. I think a digital tax would be far more suited for the much needed equilibrium. Um, but um, to quote Tim Wu, if we give up net neutrality to afford a better internet, it's like selling a picture to afford a better frame. And if we allow ISPs to exercise the termination monopoly, um, we'll end up in a splinter net because that's the business model that we know from the telephony era. And I think we'll continue that discussion, um, but I also would like to um, address the other issues that were raised here around um, uh, zero rating in particular, and the esteemed commissioner who has uh, uh, spoken previously. Um, I was uh, invited to give uh, expert testimony in the uh, case in front of the Constitutional Court of Colombia that the Commissioner has mentioned. It concerns a provision in Article 56 of the Colombian Net Neutrality Law, which is basically a circumvention of the non-discrimination rule. Telcos are allowed to discriminate if they believe that they are fulfilling a market demand. We only know this weird provision to exempt the non-discrimination rule based on market demand from one other country, that's uh, South Korea, and I hope that Professor Park can elaborate more on that. Um, but I would really like to uh, take a moment, particularly at an IGF here in, in Africa, and raise the question to also the auditorium here, um, what zero rating is really doing, uh, particularly in the global south. The answer that we have gotten from our colleagues in India in their struggle to enshrine net neutrality protections in law is that they see it as a form of digital colonialism. Because instead of giving people access to the full internet, it's a telecom company deciding which individual applications uh, the people are allowed to access. And often we assume that there are also payments from, for example, Facebook, uh, in order to have their applications zero rated. And that, of course, is a bribement of telcos that runs contrary to the human rights obligation that telecom operators have. They are a vital piece of infrastructure in an information society, and we need to hold telecom operators to human rights standards. Um, and more particularly because the commissioner said users request zero rating. Of course they request it if the price for data volume in Colombia is low. We have seen this over and over again throughout the world, that um, when zero rating is outlawed, the prices stay the same, but magically the data volumes doubles or triples. Uh, we've seen this in India, we've seen it in Canada, we've seen it in Slovenia, Netherlands, Austria, and Germany. And we believe that zero rating just creates an incentive for artificial scarcity. Think about it. You can only exempt an application from data caps if the data caps are low enough to still give the application a priority lane to the user. And I believe that any form of application-specific traffic management and zero rating, any form of discrimination in that regard, is contrary to the freedom of choice of users. And this becomes really self-evident if we look at the aforementioned study from the Colombian telecom regulator and the study that we have done in 2019 about the zero rating situation in Europe before zero rating was outlawed in the continent. And there we saw that Facebook is always the main beneficiary of these things. That's the case in Colombia and that's also the case in Europe where among the top 10 zero rated applications, four were from Meta Incorporated. Um, and, uh, Lastly, I uh, want to say that I'm really uh, uh, sad that uh, uh, Ms. Reinders is not here with us today. The European Commission has opened up a very important debate. Um, they have so far left us in the dark. There's no clear process. Uh, none of this is in the work program of the EU. We have no consultation. 
and more and more actors, including seven EU member states, uh, uh, have the fear that um, the European Commission gets more and more captured from the telecom industry on this very important question. And um, there would be more to say, but I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for this uh, rather uh, enlightening and, and, and critical perspective. It's very good to have uh, both sides of the debate here, and we will have some uh, a brief space for a question and answer in a, after the next presentation, and then also at the end, of course, an open debate to deepen this. Uh, it is, of course, uh, a point that really struck my attention was indeed the, the consumer demand because I, I think those of us that are in this net neutrality debates in it have been in net neutrality debates for for years uh, it always looked like a kitchen and egg uh, situation like uh, consumers want uh, this kind of offering because they really want them or because they are the only offering available and uh, there is no uh, the market that is not offering an alternative. And we have seen it actually when uh, regulation uh, is implemented or adopted, uh, the situation might be different. And I mean, uh, India uh, is a very good, a very telling example, but there are many others in Europe uh, and Portugal has decided to uh, take a very, uh, very vocal stance on zero rating only one week ago. Uh, now, without uh, entering too much into the details of, of discussion, because we really have uh, a couple of segments of Q&A precisely for this, I would like now to give the floor to uh, Marit, who works for Ethno, and that has been one of the uh, main proponents, if not the main, of this uh, fair share uh, proposal that was mentioned by Thomas. And so we have the, uh, the great pleasure to have Marit with us to discuss what are the what would be the merits and why this kind of proposal has been introduced. Please, Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca, and uh, thank you for inviting Etno to this discussion. Um, and thank you also for being a, a relentless advocate for, for all of us, an ambassador for the open internet. I know that this is not the first session that you're organizing at the context of the IGF, or indeed the, the European IGF, the Eurodic, on the, on the topic. So, um, very interesting uh, uh, views from the previous speakers, and especially also very uh, good to hear from uh, the Colombian uh, commissioner. I didn't know myself, I'm, I'm not so familiar with the um, situation in Latin America, so it was very interesting to, to hear from that point of view as well. Before making comments on this fair contribution uh, issue, I'd like to just make a few remarks on the internet and the open internet issue as such, because of course, we have a long, long history on this in Europe, and I think that um, although it is maybe not uh, the, the first topic on the table in terms of new policy initiatives in the EU, it is still something that is constantly there. So, Etno, we are a firm believer in the open internet, and we actually do defend this vision both at the technical and policy level. And technical level is also very important today because if we look at the global internet infrastructure, that is of course based on open internet standards. And we know very well that in the recent past there have been some challenges to try and change the standards, uh, the global internet standards that allow us to have this interoperable internet. So we have been very vocal on this and, and calling for, for to keep the open and global internet intact so that that will also then of course uh, benefit us operators but SMEs and all of us to keep the internet interoperable and accessible for all of us. But also on the policy side I think it's uh, very important to mention that there are the open internet regulation of course which is a very key block but also other issues that are related to shutdowns, uh, internet blocking etc. And we at Etno have been certainly always very much um, advocating for openness to the extent possible. And we all know that in some countries, of course, we have some legal obligations as telecom operators, especially when there is uh, online online uh, criminality and, and, and such occasions. So I think that when we look at the European Open Internet Regulation, I think that's been now in, in place for many years. And from our point of view, the regulation is actually very stable. And there haven't been many 
issues in terms of implementation or interpretation. Of course, in the beginning of the regulation, there were always a few test cases, if you like. But actually, if you look, at, look back in the history in the last years, the, the uh, regulation has been rather stable. Now, there have been a few external factors, maybe to highlight here, and it already came up as well, that had have perhaps challenged, you could say, the regulation. And one is the pandemic um, that Madam uh, Commissioner already mentioned. So also in Europe, of course, the traffic patterns changed quite dramatically, and operators had to then react. But we were very much reassured by also our regulators that this was well within the scope of the regulation. Second one was this Russian war on Ukraine and, and the fact that there are now some sanctions in place that include website blocking, which are, of course, based on regulation in Europe. And while this is not something that operators we like to do, but again, there was a legislative package behind, so, so that um, we were, let's say, convinced by our policymakers and regulators that this was within, uh, within the scope of the Open Internet Regulation. But it would be very interesting to hear, we have a, a good audience here also from other parts of the world on how, how other parts of the world actually think about net neutrality, because I think Europe, alongside Colombia, are one of the few places in the, in the world where you have a very solid regulatory framing around the open internet issue. And especially also it's a shame that we don't have a US speaker here, because of course the US used to have an open internet regulation or policy or, or legal uh, legislation, let's say, until 2015, but have since repealed it. So it would be interesting to see as well what have been the impacts, if any, in, in the US in that regard. But, but those were my introductory re remarks on the open internet in general. Um, and now that we have included the fair contribution in this open internet discussion today, I'd like to make a few remarks. So I'm very happy, Luca, that you already mentioned that this, you, what you call fair share, and we like to call the fair and proportionate contribution uh, principle, is different from the sending party pays principle. So we are not looking at the sending party pays principles as, as, as maybe it was discussed 10 years ago, or kind of a heavy regulatory uh, across the board uh, uh, regulation or, or some kind of a policy, but we are very much looking at a more targeted approach, light market driven approach that would help us, the operators, ensure that we have good connectivity available for all end users. And we also have to, I have to say up front, that we don't actually believe that this issue of fair contribution and the net neutrality regulation or the open internet, as you say, Luca, there's a little bit of a difference, but the net neutrality regulation, we don't think that these two are independent in, ca in the case of Europe or that they are, let's say, mutually exclusive. So we very much believe that both of these can exist in parallel. And also, it would be good to highlight that when we talk about the fair contribution as ETNO, so we are, of course, thinking about the European digital ecosystem. So we're not talking about the global ecosystem, nor claiming that this is something that the whole world should be doing. It is just that in the European context, where we see certain dynamics and also a very specific regulatory framework on the telecommunications sector, that we believe that this, this would be a good solution going forward. And indeed, as was already said, so we have been one, one of the advocates for this, um, uh, this principle. And um, maybe just a few words to explain, so what exactly do we, do we mean by it? Um, so the European Commission, actually, now we have, um, these, these have been recently um, approved, so we have now two policy documents from the European uh, Commission that are quite clearly outlining that all market, and I'm looking at my notes because I'm trying to quote it um, uh, literally, so all market actors benefiting from the digital transformation should assume their social responsibilities and make a fair and proportionate contribution to the public goods, services and infrastructures for the benefit of all Europeans. And this is in two documents. One document is about digital goals in Europe and another one is about digital rights and principles. And what is important to note as well that the document on the European rights and principles not only recognizes this principle of fair and proportionate contribution, but also in parallel endorses the open internet principle. So these principles are seen as complementing each other and very much coexisting rather than somehow going against each other. So from our side, of course, the discussion then, if we look at the ethno viewpoint purely, so what we are seeing is 
and, and Thomas, I think, already mentioned, is this ever-increasing uh, internet data traffic volumes, and also the fact that the data generators, the, the data generators are more and more concentrated. So we are seeing that there is more and more, let's say, market power being concentrated to certain data generators, then that then leads to certain types of dynamics in the digital ecosystem in Europe. And some of those dynamics are to do with very much to do with the business model and the commercial practices, commercial negotiations between uh, the two parties. So, so let's say the let's call them the the big internet uh, companies, and and on one hand, and the European telecommunications sector on the other hand. So what we see is clearly an imbalance in bargaining power between our two two let's say camps, if you like. And of course, because we have the open internet regulation in place, so we are not talking about pricing uh, content, etc. But we are stepping back one step you know, outside of, of the, let's say, in the value chain. And this is especially can be seen in the IP interconnection market. And then on the other hand, we also, what we are perceiving is that there is, seems to be a very clear asymmetry in terms of the application of ex ante regulation obligations on the network operators, but also then, of course, the fact that the, the global internet giants are not subject to uh, such a serious regulatory regime as, as our sector has been for many, many years. So, so there are various, let's say, market imbalances that we are seeing, and this combined with the data, uh, data volumes, it is making um, the European digital ecosystem unbalanced and also financially, frankly, unsustainable. And also here I might add that we have very ambitious political goals in terms of connectivity in Europe and, and other digital targets too, but the European Union aims to have um, five, both 5G and fiber connectivity 100% covered or uh, within the European Union. So there is, a, let's say, limited time to make this happen. So from our point of view, we're not talking here about internet fragmentation or changes to the internet infrastructure as such, the technical infrastructure. It is really about the business models that are running on, on top of that infrastructure in the digital ecosystem. And I think that Hence, you know, we are seeing that this is rather a European business discussion that needs to be looked at, that, you know, has a very specific European history, but um, we are not actually then linking this directly into the open internet model as such. So maybe I'll just um, stop there and, and let others also make their first comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marit. And uh, I think what we're going to do now is uh, allow for a round of questions and comments from the audience online or in the room. But just before that, you know, I wanted to jump in because you mentioned a few times that you are obviously giving the ethno perspective, but saying how this is rooted in the European context. But there is clearly, like with many policy debates, a, you know, a contagion of Brussels effect that flows into other parts of the world. And I can say this from the Indian perspective where I come from, we are already seeing where you know speakers before me have mentioned that there is a strong net neutrality regime there is a strong stance on zero rating that's been taken but in light of this discussion around fair share and fair contribution we have seen the uh, telecom industry in india which historically has been advocating for bringing ott players under the fold of regulation etc so talking about regulation in other ways has also now started talking about uh, they've written a letter recently to the government talking about uh, the need for fair share and fair contribution and citing the discussions and the start of the discussion in Europe as an example. So I think just like we saw in the case of net neutrality, even this will certainly have repercussions uh, beyond Europe. Um, but it would be interesting to hear from others in the room on uh, you know questions or comments around that. So let me just open it if there are any questions from the audience so far. see anything in the room yet uh, we, we don't have the chat in front of us okay any comments okay so uh yeah we are we are not see we are not able to see the, uh properly the room so uh marit or thomas if you if you see that there is anyone willing to provide the comments or ask a question uh, please tell us so because you have my mic in front of us 
otherwise we can uh, keep with some comments taking questions from the online in the chat uh, and uh, um, or provide comments so is there any uh, one on the, in the room that wants to provide comments or questions I don't see anyone so actually we can uh, I can take advantage to provide we have one question on what was uh, oh, Luca, yeah, sorry, we have sorry, one sorry, question. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, it's more like a comment than a question. Uh, my name is Lars Eggert and I chair the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. So we build like the plumbing, right, for those sort of things that, that you're mostly talking about. And sort of one thing that I want to maybe remind us of is that I think it's reasonable if certain geographies like the EU are concerned, you know, how they can encourage services to stay local. We, we at the same time need to be careful that we don't coerce the underlying global infrastructure into a shape that isn't sort of let's say optimal for serving the entire planet right there's there's uh, the services and then there's the infrastructure and we, we sort of need to pay attention to um when we when we try to establish a legitimate uh, goal at the service level that that we don't sort of make the internet less efficient as an accident thank you Yes, indeed. I think I think that is a very good point. And actually, I think we we all uh, we can we all agree that uh, it's a noble goal to uh, try to, uh, on the one hand, uh, have the play market players that have a, a very large size to contribute to the uh, infrastructure. Uh, the development of the infrastructure, the funding of the infrastructure, and also at the same time, time to try to keep local uh, and distributed, uh, if we want, uh, the architecture of the internet as much as, as we want. But then we don't have to also forget that the, the majority, on the one hand, most of the services and uh, especially large platforms uh, are not, they do not only rely on uh, traditional uh, telecoms operators uh, uh, infrastructure to provide their service. They also create enormous content delivery networks and enormous, they invest enormously in infrastructure. So it may be a little bit an overstatement uh, when we hear in some discussions that uh, uh, service providers are, are free riders, uh, because on the one hand, they invest enormously in this kind of local infrastructure in, in to enhance the quality of service for the users. And then on the other hand, it's also true that if large platforms has a lot of, have a lot of users, uh, well, the users are already paying <laughs> a fair share for using uh, internet access. So if you have uh, a lot of users of a given telecom operator uh, using, let's say, Facebook or uh, YouTube, uh, they will be already contributing with the, the, the infrastructure costs that this traffic generate on the one hand by, uh, by giving, uh, by paying their monthly fee to operators. And on the other hand, also uh, by uh, having these services investing in content delivery networks and uh, what has also been called the flattening of the internet. So creating other infrastructure. So it's a, it also, it's also a little bit uh, uh, bizarre if, if you want to, to reconcile this, what was mentioned by uh, Commissioner Del Vecchio about uh, uh, users driving this demand. And on the other hand, uh, what was mentioned about the fair share and being uh, large platforms that drive this traffic. It, it is it is it is very bizarre to have both these uh, these uh, perspective at the same time, and one should also remember that uh, yes, uh, on the one on the case of the user driving demand, it is not again in the case of zero rating, it's not really obvious that users are driving demand, but maybe it's the only thing that they are offered. I can give you I can provide another Latin American example of Brazil, where according to recent statistics. And 99% of users uh, use primarily social networking and instant messaging apps in their uh, to to connect to the internet. 
Uh, but again, not because I'm not sure that that is because they are they, that is their demand. It is maybe more because uh, zero rating schemes are used by uh, eighty percent of the population, which is poor. So if you if you are, I mean, let's uh, not not have Europe in mind for a moment, but let's think about most developing countries. In developing countries, the majority of the population is poor, and so if you have to pay. A, if you have zero rating where uh, services are supposedly for free uh, but in reality paid with your personal data uh, you the majority of the population will choose them not really because they demand them but because that is the only option perceived as free but in reality in reality is subsidized by large social media corporations and again no one here is in this discussion i think is trying to be the advocate of very large platforms that have created a lot of distortions and concentrations uh, in and have for many sides for many reasons have a negative impact on the architecture of the internet but perhaps the uh, the uh, in a, diff a better way of having them contributing to social costs uh, and negative externalities they might generate would be to tax them properly rather than asking a, a fair share contribution to something that other users are already backing with with, with their financial capabilities. Uh, I'm, I'm just introducing some provocation here in the debate so that we can maybe have reactions from speakers. And uh, also I'm checking if KS Park is already connected or not. Uh, I'm not seeing in him in the chat so may I ask you again, Marit and, and Thomas, to check if KS is in the room, because I'm not sure if he will participate remotely or or uh, uh, in on site. Listen, um, I don't think he has at least identified himself. <laughs> I'm not sure I would okay. recognize him, so but uh, we don't I, have I, I any certainly hands up would. here. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> He's not okay. in the room, sadly. Okay. So um, we, we, have, we, have, we, we, are, we are we have lost KS. Uh, so if we have any, uh, any replies from the initial panelists, uh, Commissioner Delvecchio has an, had another uh, commitment, so she had she has just left. Uh, mm -hmm. So if Thomas or Marit want to reply to any of the comments, otherwise we can then uh, pass to the yeah. second segment yeah. of the session. I we have um, any reply. Um, just to tie a few things up that, that, that we just heard, yeah. I, I think one important thing that's sad that uh, the Commissioner can no longer hear this. Um, zero rating doesn't work like you take a pan and just circle a few apps on your smartphone and then they are magically excluded from your data cap. It actually requires commercial agreements between the provider of the app and the telecom operator, every telecom operator that wants to zero rate them. And they also include technical identification criteria. So you actually, as a telecom operator, have to no longer just transport the packages, but you have to open every package up, look, ah, which application is inside, and depending on what you see, you count them differently. They either count against your data cap or not. They either still go through the pipe or they are dropped because you're out of data volume. So you need to do something called the packet inspection to do zero rating. And that means there is a privacy cost for these types of programs. And there's also a cost on the side of the provider of these applications. Most services can only afford between one and three of these zero rating relationships. Doing more is unattainable because you need to have 20, 30, 50 thousands of zero rating deals that are ongoing if you really want to be zero rated all across the world. There's only one company that does this effort and that's Meta, Facebook. And so we also have to see that these zero rating offers inherently tinker with the way in which the internet was meant to work. And we so far have no interoperability standard here, also because of course it's not technical classes that are zero rated. It's famous and commercially strong brands of apps that get zero rated. There is a marketing underlying value why telcos are even doing this in the first place. And those two issues that we're discussing today are interlinked. In Europe, until last year, we had zero rating in all but two EU countries. So almost everywhere you had zero rating. That meant that exactly the type of big tech 
platforms that the telecoms now say they are evil and they are cluttering up the pipes, they are sending too much data. Until last year, this data was free. This data was sponsored and the users were incentivized to use YouTube and WhatsApp. And so it's a little bit difficult to now turn around and demand money for something that until last year you were giving away for free. And I um, also agree that uh, uh, this is not just something that can be uh, looked at isolated in the EU. This will have global repercussions. Um, the telecom industry doesn't want to be a dump pipe. They want to sell us more than just access to the internet. They want to sell us individual services or get money from those services. And net neutrality prevents them from doing that. And whenever they see the other ways to no longer be a Tom Piper are not possible, then they turn around and go the interconnection route. And we'll see this debate replicated. Um, I hope we can prevent it in Europe. But no matter if we succeed or fail, I fear that this debate will proliferate to other world regions as well. Can I go first? OK, thank you. Um, so I'll make uh, just a few, few comments, Luca, on your, as you say, provocations. Um, so um, one is the, you mentioned about the investment in CDNs by the big tech, etc. That is, of course, true. The, the amount of investment is not in the same category as, of course, the amount of investment that uh, telecom operators put into the networks that we are building in Europe. But, but yes, there is some investment going into CDNs um, and, and caches uh, by, by the big tech. Now, then you might still ask that are these, whose benefit are these CDNs and caches actually working for? Who, who is the ultimate beneficiary? Because, yes, they are bringing the data closer to the user, but if you then look at the interconnection market in Europe, which traditionally has been defined by being peering and transit, you now see that various reports, including Barrack's reports, are saying that, in fact, CDNs <coughs> are now becoming a substitute for transit. And also, we had a recent analysis Mason report that was raising CDN as one of the three ways to interconnect um, IP traffic. So you might say that now, the let's say, the, the big tech giants are closing in in the communication, uh, in the connectivity value chain. And we should be looking at when we're talking about, for example, IP peering, the market definition that we have in Europe is, is no longer relevant, that we actually, the whole market has changed so much that we should be looking and assessing these things in a very, very different way. So I think that's okay. Yes, there is some value into it, but it has at the same time exchanged the dynamics in the markets and our regulation and our regulatory framework um, is no longer actually following. And then you were talking about um, the users paying, uh, paying more than once, etc. I mean, from the telecom operator point of view, the only reason why telecom operators are in business because we have end user customers and we want to make sure that they are still our customers next month. So we are trying to uh, provide the best service possible and the best quality possible to, to provide them the, the content that indeed they want to see and, and have. So I don't think there's any, any um, secrets about that. However, if you look at other markets, for example, um, I don't know, postal or e-commerce, postal service. So if you're ordering a packet from an e-commerce platform, you are paying both for the packet or whatever product you're buying, and then you also pay for the postal service. And in this business model, sometimes it may be the consumer who pays for the postal service. In other cases, it is the e-commerce platform who is also paying for the postal service. So this is not, this is not something unheard of. Um, actually, it's rather common. Um, also can be, you know, we can look at things like newspapers and, and other things, right? Um, so, so this is a very common business model, but for historical reasons, this hasn't been the business model for, uh, for telecommunication operators. So yeah, maybe those are just uh, one, of the, one of the reflections. And maybe one more point on the users paying. So you made the point, Luca, that it is the user asking for the, for the content. Well, indeed, that, that is the way. But we, what we are also observing is that the big giants and the, and the platforms, they are also now using technologies in a way 
that they are, let's say, making it very easy and facilitating and pushing some content to a certain level when we're talking about video, for example, YouTube. And they are, let's say, compelling the user to use as much content as, as, as possible. So they're trying to maximize, in fact, the time that the end user would use on their platform. And this is because, of course, they get more money from advertisers if they can use show that some person is spending two hours in, instead of one. And this is, you may argue, that is the user user's choice in a way, yes. But there are also very kind of, uh, well, different business practices that are being used to try and maximize the user's attention there. And we do not think that this is necessarily transparent to the user, but also not necessarily fair then when you con uh, con uh, consider the total um, and the whole ecosystem. Thank you. And now, now I pass on to Lars, who had another comment here in the room, Luca. Okay. okay. So. Thank you. Um, uh, I, will, I could say a lot about what you just said, but I, I think uh, we are out of time. But I want to go back to what you said about um, the zero rating infrastructure. So, so there's a there's a push from vendors of telco equipment, and there's a an interest from operators to put in infrastructure that administer basically resource scarcity, capacity scarcity, right? Um, and that's money that's being taken away from building out capacity, which they need to do anyway. Right? So in some way, zero rating can be thought of subsidizing the hyperscalers, the entrenched parties, and not making more capacity available for new players to enter the market or smaller businesses to have the ability to reach the customer. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very dangerous sort of slippery slope. Um, it sounds very attractive, but there's a lot of downsides to it. Thank you. Thank you to everyone in the room. And with that, we are actually going to transition now to the, you know, the second phase of our uh, panel discussion. And before that, there was one comment in the chat from Sabello, and I think that speaks to the Indian example that Thomas was giving earlier. So I'll quickly address that where, you know, he talks about how when zero rating was removed, the data cost stayed the same and the data usage actually went up. And there, just to clarify, that did happen. But uh, I wouldn't say it is causation, uh, it's just correlation. So what happened there was that in parallel around 2018, there was a ban on zero rating and there was the entry of a new telecommunications player in the Indian market, which completely transformed the way the market works, the dynamics, the competition, so prices were dropped. So these two things happen in parallel, which supports the point that, you know, it doesn't mean that it's all gloom and doom and uh, success and, you know, progress will stop if you bring zero rating. But I wouldn't say it was, uh, you know, as a result of the zero rating regulation, it was uh, parallel developments that took place. Uh, but with that, now let me invite um, Angela Daly, who is uh, from the professor at the University of Dundee to come in and uh, give us her intervention, please. Angela, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, just give me a second. Sure. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see me okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me um, to speak. And um, yes, yeah, sorry, I can't be there in person um, for what sounds like some really good uh, discussions. So I'm going to talk um, following from some of the previous uh, uh, interventions, particularly in the European um, from a European perspective, I'm going to talk hopefully very briefly about the situation in the United Kingdom. Um, as you probably are aware, the United Kingdom left the European Union and European law and regulations in, over the last couple of years. And I just wanted to point to some developments around net neutrality, which are currently going on there, uh, which are actually quite similar to what is being proposed in the European Union. Some very similar dynamics in the debates, um, but because the U UK is now kind of out of EU law or the um, jurisdiction of EU law, broadly speaking, there are some kind of local divergences. Um, so basically, from the UK perspective, uh, net, and also from the academic perspective, net neutrality had been a topic which generated a lot of discussion and debate up to the, excuse me, 2015 net neutrality regulation. The UK was still a member of the European Union at that time and did, and so current UK law reflects um, the EU's open internet regulation for net neutrality um, and has not yet been changed uh, since the UK left the European Union. Um, there was a lot of debate around net neutrality um, at that point in time in the UK as well as in other parts of the European Union. But in more recent years, there has been less attention and particular, particularly less academic research about 
how those um, how the regulation has been implemented, what actually happened. I mean, academic attention has um, uh, shifted to other issues, um, particularly uh, when it comes to telecoms um, and the internet has shifted much more towards um, what is now in the EU, the Digital Markets Act, um, and in the UK is the Digital Markets Unit. So issues around kind of the role of telcos uh, in particular the role of net neutrality, how it's been implemented, how it's, has it worked or has it not worked, has been a rather neglected topic, at least among academics. Um, about two years ago, myself and some collaborators at the University of Strathclyde, also based in uh, Scotland, in the UK, we decided to revisit um, the issue of net neutrality. And just for full disclosure, we wrote a report which was funded by British Telecom BT, uh, but doesn't reflect the views of British Telecom um, and, uh, and reflects our own views. But I think it's important to disclose um, that this was uh, funded research. Um, what in, in uh, brief, we released the report uh, just over a year ago um, and kind of generally found that um, net neutrality has generally been kind of enforced and reasonably well followed uh, by telcos and others in the UK as in other parts of, and, and also, sorry, in other parts of the European Union. Um, issues that remain kind of difficult and not necessarily that well resolved are, as I'm sure you can probably guess from the preceding discussions, um, zero rating and also the role of content delivery networks, uh, so CDNs. Um, what has happened since um, we released the report, and I'll share a link to it in the chat, um, is that the UK Telecommunications Authority, Ofcom, um, has uh, up or released um, some um, kind of, of its current thinking around uh, net neutrality in parallel to developments going on in the UK around the Digital Markets Unit, which is a similar kind of intervention to the Digital Markets Act in the European Union, um, but is not yet uh, legislated in. So it possibly early next year, there will be kind of like new legislation around the Digital Markets Unit in the UK, um, really aimed at kind of the power of large online intermediaries um, but in the interim, uh, Ofcom has uh, released a new kind of consultation, a new kind of uh, on its new thinking around how to implement the current net neutrality rules. So it's proposed um, some revisions to its guidance on how net neutrality rules should apply in the UK. This is still within the um, framework of the current legislation, which, as I mentioned, still reflects um, the EU's open internet regulation. Um, and essentially what the um, what Ofcom is uh, proposing is various what it calls clarifications around the kinds of uh, packages and specialized services that um, internet service providers uh, can offer as it claims, as Ofcom claims, this is within the current rules, um, including things like uh, what traffic management measures can be used to deal with congestion and what zero rating packages are appropriate or not. I think one of the previous speakers said that zero rating, or I mean, maybe I'm, mis, uh, I'm mischaracterizing this, um, that zero rating is kind of prohibited in the EU. I think it's a little bit, if, if, maybe I misheard this. That's not at least the case in the, in, um, sorry, the UK, where some forms of zero rating are um, or have been um, allowed, um, so long as they essentially don't uh, impact too negatively on competition. So the UK is taking a very competition uh, or supposedly very competition um, driven approach to the issue of net neutrality and zero rating. Not so much a kind of, I would say, a consumer oriented or rights oriented approach. Um, one thing though to note, which I think maybe is a feature of the UK, but it would be interesting to hear from others about what is happening happening in their countries and jurisdictions is the use of zero rating in a kind of public interest way. So during the COVID-19 lockdowns in the UK, where like many other places, there was a correspondingly you know, large use of data and internet services and so on. Um, in fact, some public health, um, the UK has a 
uh, public health care um, uh, system, uh, the National Health Service, uh, a universal public health care system. Um, so some information um, that was available from the uh, National Health Service was actually kind of not zero rated. So you could access that uh, without using any data allowance. Um, and there was also there were also discussions about whether certain education materials would be um, zero rated, uh, particularly to uh, people from low income backgrounds um, who had children at home who were um, home um, remote schooling. In the end, that didn't happen, but there were these discussions, the health information did happen. And I believe, although I'm not entirely sure about this, that it was kind of based on the goodwill of telcos that they would not charge data. I don't know if there was a formal um, contract or agreement between the government or the health service and the telcos. Um, but that is kind of an interesting feature because as we discussed at the time, our report was um, launched last year, we are not entirely sure that those, that zero rating, that content in a kind of public interest way entirely complies with net neutrality rules. I don't think net neutrality rules, especially around zero rating, were really um, conceptualized as being something that would facilitate genuine public interest access to certain forms of information. Um, but it seems that that did happen sort of in the UK um, and at least was not no enforce or no negative enforcement action was taken um, against uh, any of the telcos that did that. Um, so what Ofcom is also um, proposing in its clarification of the guidance is to um, uh, facilitate certain kinds of prioritization and zero rating access from a public interest perspective, for instance, to emergency services, uh, which I think is a kind of interesting intervention um, because I've not seen it so much happen elsewhere. Um, I mean, yes, we've had the debates around meta and, you know, in a zero rating, particularly in emerging economies, um, and how, I guess, ostensibly there's arguments that this is in the public interest where there's actually not, uh, where it might not be. Um, but I think in the UK case, we have some examples of thing, of zero rating of genuinely public interest content. Um, and it's a bit unclear to me that whether this is compatible with current net neutrality rules or not. Um, but at the moment, um, Ofcom is consulting on these proposals. And as I mentioned already in the new year, there will be likely more going on about the digital markets unit. So about the kind of relationship between online um, intermediaries and other players, including telcos, um, it remains to be seen uh, how net neutrality may or may not fit into that. Uh, but it will be interesting, in my view anyway, to watch the UK um, and see how this uh, proceeds in um, next year, and also to what extent there is convergence or divergence between the UK and the European Union. Because while the UK is not within the European Union anymore, it does have um, a trade agreement with the European Union in which, from memory, there are net neutrality provisions. So if the UK did depart kind of substantially from what is going on in the European Union, could there be a trade issue um, about that? So one to watch, um, and interested to hear if anything that I've been saying about net neutrality, zero rating in the public interest is turning up elsewhere. Thanks. Thank you very much, Angela. These were excellent comments. And before I give the floor to Sabello, uh, I just wanted to, to react quickly to this because there is uh, actually uh, some, uh, this is a very good example of how actually zero rating could be something also used uh, for the public interest. Uh, there are countries like Jamaica, there are very few countries, but there are countries that are zero rating public uh, online services since many years. Like I think Jamaica was the first one since 2017 where public services, so por por online portals for public services are accessible without consumption of uh, data allowance. And this is a very good example of how this could be interesting to be to use in in practice. Again, let's remember that this uh, this uh, we have spoken a lot about Europe, but these practices are extremely extremely widespread in the global south, where people do not have the money to pay for internet access. So what is zero rated is frequently what is the internet experience for many people. And that is a, a, a very uh, uh, strong dimension of internet fragmentation 
if you want, that zero rating can produce as a negative externality. The fact that the internet becomes only a couple of platforms that are uh, zero rated. Uh, and uh, the interesting, I think what is interesting, and we, we did actually a study with this coalition uh, in 2018 mapping what kind of services were zero rated at the time. And in, a, in 2018, the, the most interesting find, funding, uh, finding, I think, was that in the 100 countries that we that we analyze, in 98 out of 100, uh, platforms of the that are part of what now is called the meta were zero rated. Uh, so it, there is one player that is actually subsidizing access to its own uh, platforms around the world globally. And at the time, there were only one country that was subsidizing uh, access to public services. So imagine, if, for instance, if you have to pay taxes online, as happens in most countries nowadays, you have to pay for internet access. Whereas if you have, or if you want to, uh, to uh, you have uh, online education during a pandemic, you have to pay for it. Whereas if you want to watch uh, selfies and, 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 or disinformation on social network that is subsidized and it's, it is allowed. That, so that is a, a very also important social uh, distortion we should have in mind. And also, uh, and again, I, I think we should also have in mind that to try to mitigate this kind of distortions, we should not create other distortions. Uh, it would be much better to regulate ta properly taxation, to regulate properly information, and to also to, un to understand that these, all these things are inter interconnected. And uh, if maybe, m maybe the greatest distortion we have in this moment is that we still are focusing in a kind of regulation that is in silos, uh, data regulation, data protection regulation completely separated from telecoms regulation, completely re regulated from content, uh, separated from content regulation, we should start to look at this from an interconnected perspective, because that is the kind of uh, uh, holistic perspective that will allow us actually to be, to have a sustainable governance and regulation. Uh, sorry if I'm speaking too much. I, I, now I think it's the time to introduce our, I, I still don't see KS, uh, uh, neither online nor on site. I think it's a time to introduce our last uh, speaker, of course, not least, uh, Sabello, who is uh, the founder on, of Mbala, and he has a very interesting perspective, actually, of the other components of, net, of internet openness that we have somehow neglected so far, so interoperability and device neutrality, uh, also because he has some very personal uh, 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 history to recount about how the distortion that the lack of interoperability or device neutrality can produce. So please, Sabello, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Luca, and thank you to all of the previous panelists. This is very insightful and um, very happy to be joining you all. I, I just would like to sort of examine net neutrality and device neutrality through the Sub-Saharan African mobile developer perspective uh, and also the device manufacturer perspectives. Zero rating um, in the African continent, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, is largely shaped by two realities. The first one that Africa has the largest share of the world's least developed countries, and it also has the highest cost of data. So you have people with the least amount to spend paying the most amount. In some cases, you find that Africans pay three times the cost of data that they would normally pay for if they were in the United States. And so zero rating is then seen a little bit differently. And um, we can compare that to the to what happened in uh, in India, how there was a large pushback against zero rating when Meta then Facebook went uh, into the region and met some re met some resistance. So they took those lessons and they repackaged themselves and apply the same um, the same policy and they were successful, very successful actually. Um, and so one thing that was quite surprising was that even the non even the NGOs they were quite supportive of zero of zero rating uh, by Meta and uh, Twitter and these platforms because they saw them as sort of um, a democratic means to promote open debate on issues of social importance. 
um, as a way to prevent government censorship, um, especially during internet shutdowns or when there's issues of um, great public, uh, great, uh, great public interest. And so the NGOs really took a different approach than NGOs in other parts of the world by really quite um, embracing zero rating. Uh, and the zero rating also includes internet infrastructure such, such as hotspots, public hotspots provided by Google. Uh, recently, we've seen internet backbones by Meta and Google being built under the ocean all the way to the African continent. Google just connected their last um, backbone to South Africa just about two to three months ago. Um, and so again, you know, this, is, this has not been met with much resistance issues of privacy or, or access or competition are really not quite um, quite discussed. Something else that's quite interesting too is that the zero rating is also pushed by, it's, it's so popular that the telecoms also offer a zero rating for people who can pay for it. So if the company wants to have their product, their app, their website zero rated, you now have this, this commercialized process called reverse billing. So you can then go and pay to have your service uh, made accessible to to other users. But of course, this only benefits those who are able, you know, the companies that are well funded, often Western or Eastern companies that can go in there and pay the high cost of the internet in order to make their uh, services and, and, data, um, and, and data quite profitable. Um, something that makes it much worse as well, or compounds it, is that in the continent, mobile is first. So mobile phones are the primary way of accessing any type of connectivity, any type of data or internet. So now we see even telecoms becoming more than telecoms. Now they're becoming banks. They're becoming ways to shop, ways to pay for your bills, ways to send money. And again, they also employ the same tactics where they give the advantages to themselves, where it becomes harder for the private industry to then try to create competing um, competing services as well. So this is one aspect with the telecoms. Um, I like to also look at the, the, the app platforms, such as Google Play, that are prevalent within the continent. Um, what Google does is quite interesting from a developer perspective. Um, I'll give a quick example for my company. Uh, we, we made an African language keyboard that users could access if they want to communicate in, in their own languages uh, using artificial intelligence, um, offering things such as spell correction, next word, next word prediction, and the rest. Um, what is interesting is that when you have a, a large big tech company that controls the platform for other apps, they tend to have certain advantages that they give to themselves. So for example, if you install any other keyboard on the Google Play Store, you get this big warning saying, oh, be careful, this app can take your, your credit card information, your privacy. And theoretically, that is all true. However, if you install Google's app, there's no such warning, right? even though they can do the same, and even though we know that they do the same, that we know there's some privacy issues, data harvesting by these companies, you don't see the same policies, the same warnings placed on their apps, but they're placed on other competitors. And so in the minds of consumers, this creates this illusion that, whoa, you know, is this um, a service or app by my fellow uh, you know, developer or people within the same country, you know, is it reliable? Is it safe? And, and, um, and so forth. And then with um, uh, going from the app store platforms, now even with the device neutrality, half of the cell phones made or sold in the African continent each year, they come from a single Chinese company and they come prepackaged with the apps that the same manufacturer designs. And so you have, um, social media duplicates of YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, and the prepackaged there. And it's hard to then you know, try to offer alternative competing apps because they control half of the mobile smartphone ecosystem. And then they decide what gets on those apps. And uh, so if you have a high cost of 
downloading apps. There, there was a study that was done in South Africa that demonstrated that most people ever will install just five apps on their phones, nothing more, due to the devices having lower storage, lower memory. And so when you have a manufacturer pre-installing apps, or when you have some apps that are zero rated or free, and then and, and people having such a short limited amount of apps that are possible that they can install, um, it then, you know, it sort of breaks the promise of the internet being this open uh, infrastructure marketplace with a low barrier to entry. The barrier essentially becomes quite, quite, quite high due to these limitations. And unfortunately, this is something that uh, is not quite addressed well. Uh, we're seeing now that there are phone manufacturers in the African continent. Um, by manufacturers, I mean they just assemble the parts to make the to make the cell phone. And often they want to use the most popular operating system for mobile phones, which is the Android system. But then to use the same Android system, Google requires you to install a basic set of apps that they make. So this could be like Google Chrome, Google Search, and so forth. And so if you don't, if you don't, or, or the Google keyboard, and if you don't install these apps, as a phone manufacturer, you cannot use the operating system which now keeps you away from your users who are used to using the Google operating system. And so this also gives an advantage to, you know, these large, um, large tech companies. In addition to that, in many cases, they'll even offer paid incentives. So they'll say, if you install our search engine, we'll pay you, uh, I, I forget the exact number, but it's like maybe eight cents per search or, or so, like something like that. And so now the companies are now getting paid by Google uh, to install those apps. And so now if you if you have um, a competing service, you now have to also offer the same deal. Okay, we will pay you for every de uh, device that uses our app and, and so forth. But the main issue there is that the, the greatest damage to this is that it lowers the ability for the local ecosystem to emerge, to create localized solutions that are designed for, uh, designed by local developers, designed by local companies to serve the local markets. And then it allows foreign companies to then come in and then shape the entire ecosystem. I think it was Thomas earlier who spoke about digital colonization. This is another instance of that, where now the local, where, where now you're not able to create your own local infrastructure. You now have to depend on the finished goods being sold back to you. So the data is being extracted, but then you're giving back the finished goods um, and, um, and keeping sort of like, the continent as the fastest growing digital marketplace that is entirely foreign dominated. So zero rating is, um, it, it affects quite a lot and, um, but there isn't much, a lot of policy or resistance that we can see at this, at, at the, at this particular moment um, compared to the conversations we're seeing in, in Europe, what happened in India. We just heard earlier from uh, similar efforts in Colombia to sort of, you know, assess um, zero rating, but, you know, it's not quite as pronounced and strong, uh, at least within sub-Saharan Africa. And this is something that I hope the entire sort of um, internet community can also take into account when we're thinking about the, the, the scope of these tech companies and their influence across the world. Thank you very much, Sabello, for this really excellent uh, remarks that really uh, let us understand the complexity of the issue. Unfortunately, I thought that our uh, deadline, that our, the end of our session was at 45, but actually I just noticed that it was at 35, so we are already three minutes uh, uh, above our uh, uh, deadline. So I, uh, I would like to use this uh, remaining uh, two minutes that uh, I'm sure the IGF technical team will give us to see if there is any final remarks from our panelists that should be extremely quick. Uh, do we have any final remarks either from people on site, uh, panelists on site or online? Otherwise, we can uh, start to wrap up. It looks like we don't have any final remarks. 
Luca, and maybe just I'm a quick really word of quick word yeah. of thank you here from the venue. I mean, uh, no substantive remarks, but uh, a really good discussion, I thought, and uh, uh, nice to hear views from around the world on this important topic. Just to add thank to this, um, it was yeah. uh, um, thanks also uh, uh, here from the room. Uh, we had great participation. Uh, uh, sadly, there is another session starting here physically uh, quite soon. That's why uh, there is a little bit of time pressure. But I think it is obvious that we need to continue the discussion. And um, thanks, everybody, who participated. Thank you very much to everyone for the very, really fantastic uh, presentations and uh, very lively and excellent discussion about a lot of very different dimensions of internet openness from a lot of very diverse perspectives around the world. I think it's something that is very uh, evident is that uh, we really start to have to uh, uh, analyze the complexity of the issue from a multi-layer and multi-dimensional perspective and do not only focus on either uh, the, the access uh, and network uh, layer with net neutrality or the uh, platform and app layers on the content layers but we really have to start to interconnect the full stack and try also to understand how this not only how these uh, layers are interconnected and impact on one another but also how regulation should be thought in a way that considers the positive or negative externalities of uh, any player on the other layers as well thank you very much for the excellent discussion and i will we will see you uh, at the next session of the this coalition next year i wish you an excellent igf 2022 ciao ciao Recording in progress.
Hi everyone, can you hear me? Hi Wakas, is that you? Yes, that's me. Oh, hi Wakas, great. Yes, uh, we can hear you. I can't see you yet. Okay, my video is on. I can, I can see you, Wakas. Great, good morning, Courtney. Good morning. I'm sorry it's so early. <laughs> it is what it is. Practically the night. Yeah, it's still pitch no. black here. <laughs> great, we're just getting set up. The, oh, I can see Courtney now. I think that they're um, actually going through, I've given the names of the speakers on Zoom, so I think they might uh, be using that information now to make sure that we can uh, visualize you. Sure. So I, I kind of need you to log into the, the Zoom chat, but I need my computer too. So oh. now I'm like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think, uh, okay. I didn't think How about, about I do it on my phone? Zoom? Yeah, yeah, that'd be right. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Is that useful? Yep, yep, that's perfect. Dan, can we speak to each other while you're um, the technical issues of the room? Or I, can everyone hear us? Everyone can hear us, yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Thanks. We must have been on morning. some. Yeah. Okay, so they have the Zoom links in there. Okay. Log on. Mm -hmm. And just monitor the chat and let you know if there's any questions. Hey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think Waka is gonna. Oh. Hi, can we allow uh, Laura Beccana to have her video present as Hi, well? Hi, so thank you, Dan. You figured it out? Okay, great, thanks. Yes. 